Hi, my name is Scott Shadley, and I'm a member of the SNEA Board of Directors. And today I'm here to talk to you about the evolution of compute from a storage point of view. So we spent a lot of time and energy, and personally, I've spent a lot of time and energy talking about computational storage. And as you can see from the advent of this particular event, it's continued to evolve. And I wanted to just take a different spin on that evolution and look at it from kind of the bigger picture, where it's been, where it's going, and then kind of get into what's next. And so as part of that, let's go ahead and get into the agenda. Uh, first, I wanted to talk to you about von Neumann, uh, personal connection there, and I'll get to that in a moment. What's changed and why we need to look at things a little differently. Uh, a quick introduction to our friend Amdahl and why that's of value to us. And, and we'll spend a bit of time on that particular slide because there's a lot to do with where we're going in this particular space, market, and time frame. Uh, discuss the market evolution and really what's making it necessary for us to continue to look at these new things. It's one of those uh, evolution is mandatory, is key, is successful, and is also challenging. And, and we don't want to forget that in any way either. So, and then kind of what's the forefront of change? What's, what's next? What are we going to do to do this? How do we, as individuals that are participating in these activities, people that are watching this particular event, and people that are on the outside trying to ask, what, what can we do? How do we get to the, what's next? And that's kind of where I want to go uh, as kind of the end of this particular presentation. So as we think of von Neumann, uh, this gentleman is near and dear to my heart for a couple of reasons. I am a technology geek and he's a mathematician. So that works well from that perspective. He's also a Hungarian American and I am half Hungarian. My mother is a native Hungarian. So of course I'm gonna have to be a friend to uh, a fellow uh, Hungarian from that perspective. So he came up with this concept. It's also known as the Princeton architecture. This Princeton architecture is based on the concepts of having three primary components. You have a CPU, you have memory, you have storage. And you're going to use these things to interact with each other. And there's a lot that had to be done in that point of view because you had hierarchy. You had fast, medium, and slow is my best way to interpret that. Uh, fast being the CPU, medium being the memory architecture that's associated to it. And when it gets to the storage point of view, when this stuff first came around in 1945, slow storage. We're talking punch cards slow. We're talking getting to tape, getting to floppy, getting to, getting to, getting to, and eventually evolving into what we know today as our a near and dear to our hearts, which is uh, flash-based or non-volatile based storage solutions. And so then we have the need to look at, okay, well, we started putting new things in there too. Uh, the advent of the GPU and the explosion that became available uh, because of the unique opportunities the GPU provided when it came to doing certain types of processing data. And so I call it XPU here. We have DPUs, we have IPUs, we have GPUs, we have, you call it your favorite thing. It's even called smart mix. So we want to just kind of cover the bases there. And that adds an accelerator at the simplest level of data information prior to getting to storage. And it sits somewhere between the CPU and the storage R layer, generally sharing the memory architecture. And then there's even some opportunities now where the GPU has direct access to the storage products and things like that. Certain vendors have provided that. These are all great opportunities, but there's still a, a ability to move it further than that. And so one of those, of course, center page is my friend and a near and dear to my heart computational storage. But now with the advent of everything that's uh, going on in the market and we'll get to kind of what those are, the computational memory architectures are starting to take off and we're starting to see opportunity with those. Um, this isn't new, folks, by the way. This is the evolution of, uh, of architectures. Uh, we had a wonderful movie that came out called Hidden Figures, talked about the human computer. And if you think about that, that was taking a large set of data, putting it in front of one processor, processing the data, sending it back to the main data processor, which is the, the CPU and the actual computers, and you get into the whole IBM thing, right? So computing on localized sets of data in different aspects of the concept of compute is what we're really talking about is this architecture and these things move forward. We have to think beyond just, I have a CPU. We love those products. We need them. We're never going to replace them. We have storage devices. Let's do more with them. We have memory. Wow, we're seeing an explosion in the ability for memory to, to consume it and process more as we get into some of these new architectures. But at the end of the day, let's share it. Let's be near and dear to our heart. And when it comes to sharing, that's when we have to start talking about what's changed, why we need it, and then we'll get into how 
the sharing can be impacted. And that's where we get into our, our next uh, famous uh, uh, geek of this particular presentation. So why has it changed? What has changed? And I've shown versions of this previously. So please do note there are changes in the text on this particular page. Storage is no longer slow. NVMe, PCIe Gen 4, 5, 6, memory is no longer gated. We no longer have a dim slot restriction, right? I mean, we're getting to CXL. We're getting beyond that. We're being able to put memory in a larger footprint. It's not gated by how much I can put there. I have the ability to grow that. Now, cost, power, other things associated to it, yes, all part of the evolution of this architecture is these architectures. But it really does come back down to data gravity, data size, data locality. The edge is where all this data is exploding. And those footprints aren't able to consume some of this data in the scale that we want to. You start running into a transport issue. I've shown historically the wonderful, you know, add more lanes to the freeway. You're just stuck in wider traffic, right? You get to the carpool lanes, you can help relieve some of that stress. It, it, there's still opportunities that will continue to uh evolve and change this architecture for us as we move forward. So, and also we're starting to see the organizations take advantage of this. SNIA, Nonvolum Memory Express, Compute Express Link, Open Compute Project, Soda Foundation, you name it. There's all kinds of different folks that are looking into the various aspects and combined aspects of these particular areas. And I'll show some of that examples in a little bit. Uh, and the benefits that we're seeing, faster, fewer, easier IO. Now, it's not about where it is. It's not about how it is. It is about the fact that there is data that has to have something done to it. And usually when you want to work on data, an IO is involved. Can we reduce the IO? Uh, I mentioned here we're reducing the DRAM and network tax, right? DRAM had a fixed footprint. It doesn't anymore. It's not going to as we move forward. It has greater opportunities memory, not necessarily DRAM, right? DRAM is DRAM. Uh, and then the primary CPU, right? This is where we're going to get to with Omdahl and our good friend there. It has high value work to do, and it has certain restrictions on when it can and can't do that high value data. Let's offer up services, not necessarily one specific technology or product, but services that can solve this problem. Uh, and that allows us to do improved performance because we can now parallelize work that was never parallelizable before. Take serial data in an individual's instance across multiple devices, you now have parallel processing, whether you thought you did or not. And we can also do better data management that are scheduling device functionality, take advantage of all these resources that we have. And we are doing all kinds of programming models, NDM programming model, computational programming model, other specs around things like zones and data placement, all this kind of stuff. Lots and lots of new standard work being done. And standard is important because for true networks of architectures to be evolved and adopted, we need to have some kind of way of communicating commonly. And that's where all these different working groups come into play. So why do I like Amdahl? Amdahl is a good friend of mine. Well, not really, but he's, an, he's, a, he's a, got a law for us measures the theoretical speed up of program's execution latency as a function of the number of processors executing it. Basically, he talks about the idea that parallel processing is great, but there's always gonna be a serial function that gates it. So how do we take that serial function that is gating our ability to process and parallelize it to overcome the uniquenesses of Omdahl's law? So what you've got here is 19,000 different ways, right? There's that you can deploy storage, you can deploy memory, you can deploy accelerators, you can deploy CPUs. I've just tried to show some examples here. Can we do stuff in memory? Sure. I mentioned it earlier. It's called computational memory. That's sitting up in the host compute node today. It could easily shift out into the storage or other aspects of JBOF instead of being a bunch of flash could be a JBOM. Granted, bomb's a bad choice of words, but it works. And here you're seeing that we can do it in memory, we can do it in storage, computational storage all day long, give me a call. Uh, and there's things in the middle. We call them computational storage processors, we call them smart NICs, we call them DPUs, IPUs, GPUs, we call them anything you want. But if you look at this particular graph, you can kind of see I've tried to illustrate where all of these different pieces can play because each of them have a unique opportunity to provide that value that you're looking for from a given architecture. So is it at the array level, computational storage array? I've got smarts there in a storage target that is not a host 
It's a target of my host, think NVMe over fabrics, that type of thing. It's going to do work. It can do work with CSDs. It can do work with SSDs. Hey, guess what? It can do work with a combination of CSDs and SSDs. And that's what you're seeing across the bottom of the page. There may be even another accelerator in the array box helping control some of those architectural changes when you're dealing with both CSDs and CSPs and um, SSDs. And then you got, of course, your you know, in direct attach aspects. You can have a CSP in a given box. You can have it talking to SSDs, CSDs, things like that. There's no limitation to where compute can move to if the architectures are defined, defined, decided, generated, and put together in such a way that people can take advantage of them in a common standard framework. And so computational storage started it all, 2018, God bless uh, FMS and you know getting us started there. Uh, but it doesn't mean that's where it has to stop. And people have always asked, well, what about? What about? That's exactly what this whole thing is and this evolution of this particular event. Compute, memory, storage, they're all part of this picture. And you're going to hear, see lots of presentations during this event that talk to just that fact. So from a market point of view, what does this really look like? And why do we why do we care? What, I mean, things have worked, right? What needs to change? So I've taken the liberty of borrowing uh, uh, from my friends at Gartner, hopefully Joe doesn't get too mad at me, the uh, concepts of his hype cycle or their hype cycle. This is not the official one that's coming. And these are all different kinds of architectures that involve the ability to do some kind of compute, memory and storage combination of activities. And you can kind of see where they fall roughly, if you will, in aspects of their adoption rate. And this includes things that are not traditionally spoken of in combination, right? NVMe, of course, we know is already at the point where everybody and their uncle is using NVMe. Virtualization, virtualization techniques, SRIOV, SIOV, physical functions, virtual functions, you pick it, it's out there, but it's it's evolving still but it's fairly well solidified. We have you know, a small company called VMware that's involved in that. Security, you can do all kinds of things with security. You can also do all kinds of things to break security, but it's also evolving. There's a lot of new architectures that are taking place in security that are gonna involve more compute. Post-quantum cryptography, for example, is a good example, or the concepts of attestation that's fairly new to the concept of storage devices. And there's, a bunch of things in OCP with a bunch of fun code names around Greek gods. That, uh, that's for another conversation. Data placement. Think of this as what used to exist in many different forms. Like this goes all the way back to the concept of Denali, if for those that have as bad a memory as I do of that kind of stuff. And it's currently being ratified as flexible data placement in several different architectures and things like that. Ethernet SSDs. Yes, no, yes, no. We're not really sure. They are out there. Are they going to take off? We don't know yet. That's why they're kind of sitting down there. Yeah, it's got some time to work. Computational storage, we hit that peak. We got a whole bunch of people interested. We've got new work streams going in OCP. We've got SNEA. We've got NVMe. We've got all this stuff going on. Now it's on its way to get to the point of plateau. It's, I personally feel it's going to get there. Yeah, pandemic had some small impact on that. XPUs, pick your PU and you can move it around on the graph. But overall, the architectures, as far as we know them, is being defined, standardized across multiple vendors in ways of using them in one fashion is something that's still being processed. And CXL is a fast up and comer. You could probably pick somewhere else on the graph. It looks pretty this way, right? So uh, CXL is something else where CXL combined with, right? Again, compute express link, computes in the term, why can't Compute Express Link be used with other things that involve compute? It's supposed to, that's the whole point of this. So let's take a look at the actual hype cycle. And I've highlighted five specific things that relate to this event and these architectures and where we're going next. Computational storage, I always put it number one. You'll always know why if you know who I am. Number two, uh, I love, this is a perfect example of why in 2018, we got together and called it computational storage. It's a mouthful, but it's on the chart. All the XPU guys, DPUs, GPUs, IPUs, whatever else, couldn't come together early enough to make up their minds. And our friends at Gartner called them facts. You could say that wrong and it would sound really bad. So it helps to have industry standardization work being done, companies collaborating while being able to produce new products. NVMe over fabrics, of course, we all know and love. 
Persistent memory dims. This is where persistent memory dims storage class SSDs. This is the evolution into what we're now seeing of CXL and things like that. So products made it there. There were some challenges, some hiccups, some technologies that decided to go away. But at the end of the day, they're there. They've made an impact on the market and they're going to continue to go out there. We may see, for example, for 2023, one of those little circles go a little red as per <laughs> the chart here. So, but keep in mind that all of these technologies are involved in helping improve our architectures and they all involve some form of CPU support, CPU offload, CPU data location support, and VMware fabrics. My data is not next door now, it's across the street, but I don't want to have to worry about that. Solve that problem for me. There's actual data management, data layers, and compute involved there. How we can evolve it, that's to be seen. And then Something that's not officially on here, as I mentioned, CXL is not there today. It's probably going to show up shortly if it hasn't already in the 2023 version that the guys are working on. And we have this little guy called the Smart Data Accelerator, guys. Uh, Smart Data Accelerator Interface SDXI. You can see I've kind of just thrown a couple of things up here. They're not mutually exclusive. We shouldn't be thinking of all of these different architectures. I don't care which standards body they're in, which working group they're in, who started it, who's working on it. They all have to work together because if we keep creating one-offs, nobody's going to be happy. So let's get together. Let's play nice. So you can see here, CXL at the top, of course, has its evolution. This is 1.0, 1.1 architectures. The, the 3.0 is now out where we get pooling and some other things, but the, the core interface protocols are here. SDXI from SNEA can help with that protocol work in CXL. By the way, computational storage with SDXI, you can see there's a lot of opportunity there. If you're curious, that was being presented by our friends, uh, my friends Jason and Bill in the CS Twig update. That stole that slide from them. You can see it's a, a screen cap of that. And then of course the SDXI and CXL is from an NSF webinar that was done in November. I'm sure there's plenty of other content there. First 1.0 is also out now. So you can take a chance to look at that. But these are the evolution of the next thing, right? These are memory centric things that involve the opportunity for compute to be moved into a memory layer, memory architecture, memory direction. That's one of the key aspects of what we're trying to get here. So why are we doing all of this, right? It works so well for so long. I've got a laptop and laptop's always been a laptop. It just gets a little faster, but all the components are the same, right? Right? Well, it's not really the case, right? So if we look at 2010 to 2016, in six years, there was a 9x increase in the zeta bytes generated by this planet. 9x, and it went from 2 to 18. 18 doesn't even sound like a lot anymore. It sounds like a small number. So let's take 2019 or 2018, jump it forward to 2025. We're predicting that in that same six-year window, it's a smaller increase. It's only 6x, 33 to 181, roughly six times the number. But the volume of that number is really what's unique. We've hit the hockey stick of data generation, data consumption, data analytics, data, data, data. And that's really why we need these things to happen. We cannot stand by and let what we were doing work in order to consume all that and do all that with that. And a lot of that, as I mentioned earlier, is driven by the edge. Smartwatches, these things are a wonderful invention, but I got 32 gigabytes of storage on this particular thing. That, that used to be bigger than the laptop. In fact, a lot of the Chromebooks, there's more memory in this little watch than there are on a Chromebook. I have one of those sitting here too, by the way. Um, and then you think about data locality. So this graph I thought was interesting. And if you look at it first point, you see United States has 2,701 data centers. Wow, that's a huge number compared to Germany, UK, China, even Canada, Australia, whatever you want to call it. But then think about the physical dimensions of those countries, right? So why not? That's the other, you always got to look at data in perspective. Germany is 28 times smaller, or, or the United States is 28 times bigger than Germany. So if you do that same 28 factor onto the Germany data centers, 487 becomes 13,000. Yeah, the United States has a lot, but it's nothing in comparison to the densely packed amount of information that is located in these other countries, the UK. The United States is 40 times bigger and roughly the same number of data centers as Germany. That's even more densely packed data that has to continue to grow exponentially in where it can be consumed and computed on and worked on. China, roughly the same size. Again, some of this data will go for where that's at. But again, the size of them, 
the density of them, the locality of them, the ability to get data in, accessed, computed on, and back out, right? Because none of the data that we generate, all the raw data in the world, this video file is useless if it's not processed. In the way of processing the video files from this event, it's your brain consuming them and doing something with it. So the computes local to your head, great. What about all the data I'm generating from all the autonomous vehicles out there? I read a wonderful article about an R1S that decided to brick because someone got stuck in the snow and they rocked the car and it locked the system up. Where's the system update to that or the AI that told them, hey, it's really not a car accident. I wanna get my car moving again. An electric vehicle full of charge that can't move. If you're curious, Google it and you can figure it out. Um, so how do we move all this forward? We've got to do something with it. And this is where I call it alphabet soup. I don't think any of these anymore go by <laughs> their actual names, right? SNEA is SNEA. PCIe SIG is PCIe, what was everybody calls it, DMTF. Does anybody remember what that stands for? NVM Express is really NVMe. IEEE, there's one for you. And my good friend, Mr. Uh, uh, Coughlin should know, he's the president over there. Uh, congrats on that. OCP, Open Compute Project, TCG, Trusted Computing Group. Pick an organization, join the work, drive the market. All of these are working together in some form of synergy. You have people like myself that sit across several of them. You have organizations that talk to one another through alliances and partnerships and everything else you can think of under the sun. So SNEA, for example, computational storage, SDXI, zone storage, object storage, da DNA data storage, DPUs, NVM programming model. I got to throw more alphabet soup at you. Transports, NVMe, Stay, PCIe SIG, CXL, UCI is a new one that's not even on this list as far as a graphic, right? These are all interfaces, transports, ways of moving data that are becoming standardized. Global work groups, OCP utilizes a lot of all of these architectures. Just go take a look at the latest version of the OCP storage spec and see how many pointers it has to every other one of these, these acronyms, right? SOTA is our great foundation part uh, as great work being done in the SOTA foundation around managing and cooperating some of these works as well. So I think you're getting the picture, right? The industry is changing. Our data set is growing at a slower X factor, but a significantly more exponential volume level. The traditional computes aren't working. There's a lot of things that are still in motion, a lot of things that have taken longer to get to market than we wanted them to. Opportunities abound in all of these spaces, but the market's there. When you, when you think about the amount of data that you have available in the marketplace today, 2023, 120 zettabytes. How are we going to, as an or, as a world organization around storage, compute and memory, handle this? And it all starts with where you put the data and how you work on the data. And keep in mind that computational storage, one of the biggest things we run into with that is, I can't work on my user's data because I've gone with that data across multiple devices. There's other forms of data you can manage that are a serial process that can be offloaded to make the parallel processing more effective. Back to my friend, Abdal. I'll leave you guys with that one. That's a good example of uh, how these architectures can take work. So hopefully you've enjoyed this short interlude of information. If you're interested in joining SNEA, join me over here. i uh, happy to chat with you. If you have questions for me or even the board of directors or anything else related to the SNEA work that's being done in this great event, feel free to reach out to me, come steer chair at SNEA.org. Uh, I have a counterpart, so it's chairs, but I'll take claim for it because I'm the one presenting today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this kind of rundown memory lane and what's next on the world of computational storage, computational memory, compute memory and storage, all of the above. Uh, feel free to take a moment to rate the presentation. And again, if you want to reach out, the link is there in the uh, downloadable PDF. So thanks again. I hope the two-day event has been great for you and you continue to enjoy the rest of today's activities. Thank you very much. Thank you.